So next up, we've got Robin Weir talking about caving in Africa. Thank you. Um, Africa, yes, another big place to deal with in 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> hey, well, why not? Um, f first of all, though, I'm, I'm actually going to... Uh, Answer, some, uh, answer a question I was once asked. What, what are the particular problems of caving in Africa? Well, um, you've got chaps like this floating around in caves. Now, to be honest, hyenas have very big teeth, very strong jaws, and I don't like them. But fair's fair, the only time I've actually met a hyena in a cave, family of four, they backed off quicker than I did. So maybe, maybe I look worse to them than they do to me. Secondary problem, um, bats, lovely cuddly things to most of the world, but I have to say, I got histoplasmosis once, and bats in Africa to be avoided, or at the very least, um, wear, wear, a, wear a face mask. And um, uh, in, in that photograph, um, the caver is up to his thighs in bat guano, um, I was in the same cave the year before, and I got histoplasmosis from it. Um, the thing that most worries me about, um, it, about a craw the odd crawl in Africa is crawling into a tight passage with a porcupine coming the other way. I don't know why, I just shiver at the thought of that one. Um, there's a porcupine that fell foul of a hyena, I think, and quills all over the place. However, Africa... Um, yeah, big place, uh, quite a lot of British involvement, but not much in the way of expeditions and prime exploration. I mean, a lot of it has been from people who've been working in Africa as individuals and have done a bit of caving while we were there. Um, Willie Stanton, for example, a name well known to many of you, um, spent some time in Angola back in the 50s. Um, didn't find much in the way of caves, but he took his dog with him wherever he went. Um, back in the 80s and the 90s, there were, there were quite a lot of uh, British expeditions to, to Morocco. Uh, Cerberus had a, a whole series of them, for example. Uh, one of those didn't actually get there. It got stuck in a, uh, on, on the ferry port at Algeciras and ended up in Portugal instead. Um, Unfortunately, the French got there before them and they found, um, they found themselves mainly visiting caves where the French had already been. Um, an interesting one was, was Mauritania. Now, now, I heard Phil earlier talking about Brits having found the, the deepest cave in China and um, other people over the last day and a half have been talking about big caves, big passages. Well... <laughs> Um, there was one recorded trip to Mauritania and they discovered Porcupine Cave. Um, Porcupine Cave in Mauritania was named for the porcupine quill that Valerie is holding there. And two entrances, top entrance, bottom entrance. Porcupine Cave proved to be the deepest cave in Mauritania. It proved to be the second longest cave in Mauritania, and it proved to have by far the largest single chamber in Mauritania. Um, here's a survey. Um, it was 13 metres deep, 72 metres long, and the chamber wasn't really very big at all. But hey, it's a British record. Come on, we've got Mauritania. The French haven't. Uh, um, Namibia. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to be part of, of, of this, this ex expedition. It was um, done in conjunction with an NGO a few years ago, and up in the Angolan, uh, uh, in the border very near Angola, where um, Namibia mostly is the province of the South Africans, but they, they, they'd been up there, but they'd miss most of it. Um, anyway, we, we were there to, to try to establish tourist potential to, to get a few people out of the national parks and into the tribal areas. One of the things we looked at for them was Oromana sinkhole. And um, a couple of very nice photographs there by Mark Tringham. And 
what we suggested was that they, they actually build a viewing platform. Keep the tourists out, we thought. Well, it's 50 metres deep after all. Um, keep the tourists out, but let them have a look at it. And they've done that, and it's working, which is great news. We've, we, we visited several other caves in the, in the area at the time and found, actually found a few. Um, this is one of them. Again, we, we've suggested that they set up some adventure touring um, project, uh, which, uh, uh, again, they're, they're working on, I think. And there, there's a trip mooted for next year, which hopefully will, uh, will extend that a little bit. <clears throat> An interesting one in Zimbabwe. New Year's Eve 1991, uh, a party, a mixed party of British and South African cavers descended Jungle Pot, which proved to be at minus 220 metres the deepest known cave in Southern Africa. Big excitement. So out they come, ready to celebrate on, on New Year's Day. What happens? They are arrested. Um, it, was, it is rumoured that the local police chief had celebrated New Year a bit too much. But, hey, it took them 11 days to get out, and apparently they, they, were, they were on the verge of being prosecuted for illegal gold mining. Um, I don't think they found any gold. Madagascar, another area where, um, again, mostly French and German involvement, Madagascar, but a British expedition went out there in 1986. I've got a gut feeling one or two of the people involved might just be in this room today. Um, their plan was beat the French. Well, fair, fair enough, who can have a better plan than that? Um, they went to an area where, where the French hadn't already been, and they, they thought, well, this is it, we're going, to, we're going to do well here. What happened? They got lost. And my French friends still tell me about this one. They, they, the French named the canyon from which they had to rescue the Brits. <laughs> Um, the Canyon des Anglais Perdus. Now, whether that's on Madagascan maps, I don't know, but it's ingrained in the French cave in Psyche, believe me. Um, that said, it was meant to be a scientific expedition, and the British scientists did quite well on it, from what I've read on the report. Now, the, the one part of Africa that, that really has been um, mainly British in terms of exploration is Ethiopia. And we have a whole series of expeditions to Ethiopia spread over the last 50 years. But they started with a guy called Bill Morton. Now, Bill was a, a, a British caver. He was a lecturer in ge geology at Addis Ababa University. And um, as far as I can gather, a lot of his geological lecturing involved taking his students on field trips to, um, to descend caves. Um, the, the one I most like um, of, of what he did was back in 1973, he um, explored a cave in the Makara area, um, uh, uh, sorry, the Badeno area, um, which, which he named Nkuftu Amadi after the, after the landowner. The fe it was a feudal system that operated in Ethiopia at the time. Um, unfortunately, he only had 30 metres of ladder with him and he found himself dangling about halfway down a great big pitch. Uh, so what happens? He, he's going back the next year, isn't he? Next year, revolution. He doesn't go back. Year after, though, it's all over temporarily. And um, he goes back with, with 160 metres of ladders and, and a little clutch of students to uh, help him get down there. He gets to the bottom, but... By now there has been a revolution, so they've changed the name. In Kaftu Mohu, Victory Pot. Now, so, unfortunately, and, and I, I really mean this, oh, uh, just, just an aside, I was in that same area a couple of years ago, and um, I was told there was an English caver here once before, you know. And this is, this is the man they referred to, and it was 50 years earlier, but folk memory... He was, he was remembered. Uh, I can't imagine anybody remembering me in 50 years' time, but uh, that, 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 I, I was really so impressed at that. Um, sadly, uh, Bill was, was, was shot dead in 1977 by, by rebel troops in the middle of the next Ethiopian revolution. Um, 
the main cave in Ethiopia, the one that everybody's ever heard of, and the, the lo longest cave in mainland Africa is Sophomar. Um, again, it's been known for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's actually named for a Muslim sheikh who lived in about 1000 BC or something. No, that can't be right, can it? But it must be AD. <laughs> Um, but uh, the first real survey was conducted in 1967 and it was carried out by British cavers. Um, another survey in 1971 added a kilometre and a bat survey was conducted. Um, my friend Bill Morton was, uh, was part of that one. In 1972, it was fully explored and surveyed to 15.1 kilometres and that still remains by some distance the, uh, the longest cave, longest known cave in, in, in the whole of mainland Africa. I say mainland because there are some longish ones that other people found in Madagascar. 1972, um, a big expedition, British speleological expedition to Ethiopia. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, I came along long after this. Um, as far as I'm concerned, the report they produced is still the key report to, uh, to Ethiopian caving. Um, they visited the Bale province where they surveyed Sofomar. They surveyed Nur Mohammed, Melke Mana. Then they moved to the Harar area where they um, found a couple of deep pots uh, which then were numbers one and two in Ethiopia. They visited Tigray, other outlying areas. Uh, amazing job. They, they, they spent quite a long time in the country. Um, after the Civil War, yes, there was another Civil War and a big gap in terms of cave exploration. Um, John Gunn uh, took, up, took, up the, took up the mantle um, he, was, he was at the time um, working in, in Addis Ababa University and he and his colleagues from Huddersfield University um, visited a few times in the 90s and um, explored two caves in particular, Akere Cave and Ainake Cave, which um, are the second and third longest known caves in, in Ethiopia. And as you see, they're, they're pretty close. Um, over the last few years, I've been trying to find time to get, to get there myself and um, have, a go at, uh, have a go at connecting them, but um, I've been too busy doing other things. Um, again, another short gap, and then in the period 2003 to 2007 in the Makara area, um, John, again, with uh, other people from uh, UK and people from Ab Addis Ababa University, conducted a five-year environmental monitoring project. Um, that was, again, in, in the systems, the, the Akeri Ainage system and um, in other nearby systems. Um, what I rather like is that they conducted the first exploration of Goda Mea, um, which had what was then the largest single chamber in, uh, by surface area in, in Ethiopia. It came in at about 4,000 square metres. Now, I particularly like that because uh, it's not on this slide, but I'm going off, uh, off topic. Because last year, I surveyed a, a single chamber in Ethiopia at 6,500 square metres. Now, I knew that was then the largest chamber in Ethiopia. Only today have I discovered that it beats anything in Britain as well. Um, since then, um, there's been a tourism project um, run essentially by the Bureau of Culture and Tourism in Oromia. Um, I, I've been sort of very pleased and happy and in, indeed enjoyed being part of that. Um, we've explored nearly 200 caves in Oromia and more recently in Amhara, um, including a cave called Hokawarabesa, which at 3.1 kilometers is the, now the fourth longest in Ethiopia. Um, with Nazir, the Ethiopian who's running that project, uh, he and I were the first people to fully explore that cave. And um, I have to say that had I known what Warabesa meant, I probably wouldn't have gone near the place. It, he only told me when we came out that it translates as hyena's den. 
Um, that's since, since been opened up as a tourist, uh, a, a tourist visiting cave, and the um, Bureau of Culture and Tourism had a two-day conference, um, and that was the T-shirt. Now, what's particularly good about that T-shirt is that the fellow in the yellow is me. I've never, ever been on a T-shirt before. It's quite exciting. Um, in 2014... Um, in 2014, Nazir took a phone call about 10.30 at night, in fact, just when we were winding down and about to turn in. Um, he virtually stood to attention when he answered the phone. It was the Minister of Culture and Tourism himself. And what he wanted to know was, would your cavers be prepared to um, drive to the other end of Ethiopia and try to, try to rescue some people who are missing in, in, a, in, a, in a cave called in Kavtu Tufte? Um, the answer, of course, was yes, and we spent the night packing up gear and preparing to, to move on the next day. Um, we spent a whole day on the road. We got there, got, got to the nearest town at dark. We spent the night there talking to the local people and getting organised. We set off at the crack of dawn, two-hour drive, two hours walking, and we got there. Um, we descended um, at, the, at, at the bottom of the cave entrance, for, uh, about a five-metre pitch, which uh, the locals used uh, a tree to climb down. Um, we found uh, a couple of bags of, um, of crystals. What was happening was that the villagers were using it as a mine, um, and, um, but no people. So we started, we started on down the slope, Two chambers, we were told, sloping steeply down. Um, by the time we were two-thirds down the first one, the oxygen was down to 12%, so I called it off and we, we, we pulled out very quickly. The aftermath, which I'd, I'd expected to, there to be wailing and gnashing of teeth, was, um, was that they killed a goat for us, and, um, and, um, and the aftermath of them killing a goat for us was that the goat's family came around the next day sniffing the area where we'd been eating him the night before. That, I thought, was quite sad. Um, last, last year, um, we, we visited Amhara, a uh, different caving area near, near, like, near um, Lake, um, uh, Lake Tana, which is the acknowledged source of the Nile. Um, what we found there were a clutch of three caves the highest of which was at 3,573 metres. Now, I think, and I don't know for certain, but I think that's likely to be the highest cave in Africa. Um, near there, we walked through a village where the prime product was potatoes. So I think we also got the highest potato field in Africa. But much more exciting, when we came out of the cave, we, was, we were asked, would you like to see the source of the Nile? So we walked um, a couple of hundred metres up the hill and were, were shown um, the spring from which the, apparently the highest feeder of Lake Tana flows. Lake Tana is the acknowledged source of the Nile. No, it isn't. That is the source of the Nile. I've been there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.